We've been looking at the various encounters that Jesus had with people in the book of John. And amazingly, there's quite a few long conversations that Jesus has with people, more than in the other three Gospels. So far, we've looked at Nathaniel, we've looked at Nicodemus, we've looked at the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, we've looked at the blind man, and there are a number of others too. We could probably keep this series going for another probably six, seven weeks, probably. Um, uh, there's the woman caught in adultery. Then there's the disciples of Jesus, especially Peter. You know, uh, John tends to kind of uh, uh, focus on Peter, you know, like in John 14 with the uh, uh, washing of the feet. And uh, John 21, Peter, do you love me? You know, referring back to his denial of three times. And uh, and really, it's, it's a fascinating study, study looking at these various encounters. And, uh, and one of the most amazing things is we see Jesus reaching out to good people, like Nicodemus, he was a good person, bad people, like probably the Samaritan woman, poor people like the blind man, rich people, men, women, and, and actually really an unusual amount of women for that day. Actually, one of the big arguments against the accusation that the disciples just made up the accounts of Jesus is that Jesus was breaking the cultural norms all over the place. You know, there's the adulterous woman. There is the Samaritan woman. There is the blind man. And, and a, lo a lot of other examples. And, and a lot of women. And so many of them with the name of Mary. You know, his mom was named Mary. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, the sister of Lazarus. There's Mary, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. There's Mary, the wife of Clopas, which was uh, Mary's um, sister. You know, uh, so it'd be an aunt. Mary, the mother of James. You know, if the disciples were making this up, they would have made this a whole lot less messy and they would have made it in more impressive. But today we want to look at Mary and Martha. And there's quite a bit in the book of John about them. So we see that Jesus had encounters with both of them. We're not familiar with the initial encounters that Jesus had, but we do know that they became followers of Jesus. Uh, actually, if you go back to Luke, I'll just kind of summarize it real quick. Uh, you know, Martha welcomes Jesus and the disciples into her house. And uh, Martha was busy making all the preparations. In fact, she got distracted and worried about it. And Jesus actually, what, sits her down and says, Martha, Martha, you're bothered and worried about too many things. Because she was saying, you know, well, well, why don't you tell my, my sister Mary to kind of help me? But, you know, Mary was what? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening. And Jesus says, you know, really, Mary is, she, she's, uh, she, she's, she's chosen the good part. You know, the good thing to do, the one thing to do. Uh, and so we, we were introduced to Mary and Martha in that story in Luke 10. John tells us more. And, uh, and by the way, maybe we just kind of summarize what we do know about Mary and Martha. First of all, there was actually three siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And uh, the parents are never mentioned, so we can probably assume we can't say for sure, but we could probably assume that it was the three of them and that the parents had died. We know that they were followers of Jesus. We know that they lived in Bethany near Jerusalem. Actually, Bethany is about two miles away. However, if you go there now, it takes you about an hour and a half to get from Jerusalem to Bethany because you have to kind of go all the way around the, the, uh, the big wall that they have between the uh, um, West Bank and Jerusalem. We know that they were well-to-do, maybe even wealthy. And by the way, this again just shows that Jesus encounters all types of people, rich, poor, men, women, educated, uneducated. You know, uh, he is for everybody. We also know that they lived in a big house because Jesus and his disciples uh, and others that were traveling with them, and there was quite a few, 
you know, often stayed there while in Jerusalem. It was more secluded, more private, but it was close. They could just kind of walk into Jerusalem. And evidently they had room for Jesus and everyone that kind of hung out with him. We also know that it was a big house because they tended to entertain a lot. We also know that the, this family was well known in Jerusalem, probably because they had some money. We don't know the story of how they got the money or what they did or anything like that. And so we can assume it's not that important. Uh, we do know a lot more about Martha and Mary than we do about Lazarus. In fact, uh, we, we hardly see any conversations that Jesus has with uh, uh, Lazarus, except for Lazarus come forth, you know, out of the grave. So let's, let's look at two stories. First of all, Martha in John 11. And uh, I encourage you to read through it. It's, it's just a beautiful chapter. I'm just going to probably just sort of tell the story. Martha is the main person that Jesus interacts with in this chapter. She's uh, much more prominent than Mary, certainly in this passage. So uh, the chapter starts off, Jesus and his disciples, we're not sure exactly where they are, but they get word that Lazarus was sick and please come. Jesus remarks to the, his disciples, this sickness is not, is not to end in death but it's for the glory of God. And, uh, and it also kind of says there that Jesus loved Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. Very few places that specifically kind of singles out people that Jesus loves. But Jesus decides to stay two more days. And then after two more days, he says, let's go back to Judea and uh, to see Lazarus. And it, actually, the disciples are alarmed because last time they were there, they almost got in trouble. And, uh, and you know, they, uh, they weren't sure how this is going to go. Uh, but he tells the disciples, listen, Lazarus is dead. We need to go there. And uh, we see Thomas saying, let's all go. We'll die with them because things were getting heated up in the Jerusalem area in Judea. So Jesus arrives in Bethany and, um, and says that Lazarus had been in the tomb already for four days. And a large crowd of people were there coming to console Mary and Martha. Martha gets word that Jesus is on his way and actually kind of goes and it sounds like probably meets him at the edge of town. And, uh, and one of the first things she says to him is, Lord, if you'd been there, you know, it could have been different. You Maybe you could have healed it. And then she kind of says, even now, I know that whatever you ask, God's going to answer you. And uh, Jesus looks at Martha and says, your brother's going to rise again. And Martha replies, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And then in verse 25, verse 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And, you know, many times Jesus has a, I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the living water. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and uh, the life. I am uh, a lot of things, but out of all of them, this one, I think, probably is most powerful. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Because it explains his purpose on earth, that he came to, to bring us all to eternal life, that we would all be resurrected. And uh, in fact, today, these are still, I would say, some of the most powerful words that have ever been spoken in human history, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, we also know that Jesus was obviously preparing for what would happen in the next, uh, probably next two weeks, maybe even 10 days, uh, because he knew that Lazarus was going to rise up, right? And he was going to show that he is the resurrection. 
And he also, you know, a week later, he was going to be, um, he was going to die himself and he was going to resurrect. And um, so he, he was, he was sort of, you know, he was setting the tone there. And in some ways, the disciples were right. Why go to Judea now? People, the religious leaders especially, they're upset. They want to kill him. It's not, it's not a safe place for him to be. So anyway, he tells Martha, I am the resurrection, the life. And then he says, and everyone who believes, who lives and believes in me will never die. Again, he just says, if you believe in me, you will never die. And he says, do you believe this? And I like that, you know, because I think that's a question that Jesus probably liked to ask us. Do you believe this? Do you believe that he's the resurrection of life? And Martha, without hesitation, says, yes, Lord. In fact, she says, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into this world. Now, kind of amazing because the disciples, they were still a little unclear. I mean, they, they were catching it, but uh, they um, sometimes they would kind of waver on this, but she's very clear in what she says, you know, uh, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the, even he who comes into the world. Okay, so um, we go on and then maybe let's just kind of switch over to Mary. Someone tells Mary that the teacher's here. And so, um, um, and we're probably now around John 11, verses 28 through 46 now. And uh, she gets up and goes outside because she hears, okay, Martha's talking to Jesus. You know, I'm going to go see her. Well, there's a big crowd of people there from Jerusalem, from Bethany and everywhere. And, uh, and they follow Mary out, supposing that she wants to go to the tomb and weep there. And so they all kind of follow Mary. And when Mary gets to Jesus, she falls at his feet. And she says the same thing Martha says. Oh, master, teacher, if you'd been here, maybe it would have been different, is basically what she's saying. And, um, and Jesus says, where have they laid him? And she says, come and see. And she, it says that Jesus wept. In fact, you've probably kind of heard that this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And all the crowd, they're all commenting. Some of them were kind of saying, you know, things like, wow, he really does love these people, doesn't he? He loved Lazarus. Other people were saying, well, you know, if he's such a miracle man, why didn't he kind of do something about it? You know, he could have he could have come three or four days, you know, five or six days earlier and kind of stopped this thing. And so there's a lot of murmuring going back and forth. So they go and they to the cave and the tomb is inside the cave and there's a stone put right before the, uh, you know, blocking the uh, tomb. And uh, Jesus announces remove the stone. And there's a little bit of objection. You know, Martha said, you know, teacher, you know, he's been in there four days, you know, I, it may be kind of a bad smell. And he, but you know, he insists and they roll back the stone. And then Jesus in a loud voice says, Lazarus, come forth. And what happens? Lazarus comes walking out of that tomb, out of that cave. Now he has a lot of the bandages and all that all over him because that's the way they would embalm people then. And so he says, unbind him and let him go. And they did. And it says that many people believed because they knew he was dead. And, uh, and I think one of the things we need to ask, you know, what, what, what's the lesson in this for us? Jesus is the resurrection and he's the life. And now Jesus is backing up his words. He's, he's saying, listen, this is just as it talk. This is truth. And he is, and to demonstrate that, he's, he calls Lazarus and raises him from the dead. Now, we see after that, that even though many people believed, when it got back to the religious leaders, they decided we've got to do something. This time we have to kill him. We have to do something, you know. Otherwise, our 
basically, I think they were just threatened by the power or the influence that he had over the people because people were worshiping him. They recognized, they were listening to him. And they weren't really doing that with the Pharisees and religious leaders so much. Okay, so that's, that's an encounter that Jesus has with Martha. Now, the next chapter, the focus is on Mary. And uh, this is a story that's in all four of the Gospels. Uh, this happened real sh shortly after the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, it does seem that the disciples went somewhere and then they came back. Uh, it was close to Passover. In fact, uh, Jesus' last Passover, the time when he has the Lord's Supper, and they come back to Bethany. And Mary, this time, is the primary person in the story. She's the one interacting with Jesus. And this is where she anoints his feet with the perfume. Now, this story should not be confused with the one in Luke that took place at the uh, house of Simon the Pharisee. This one took place uh, at the house of Simon the leper. And back then, a lot of times there were common names like Mary and Simon. And so they would say, well, Simon the Pharisee, he was known, Simon the leper. And we can probably assume that one time when Jesus was there in Bethany that uh, Simon got healed of leprosy. And, but anyway, there's a lot of people there and Mary takes a pound of very costly perfume and uh, of pure nard, very expensive. In fact, it's, it says it was worth translating into uh, uh, wages for today, about 11 months of wages. So you can just kind of figure that thing out. That's probably, to, you know, you can just kind of, what's the average uh, wages today, you know? Uh, I think here in Summit County, it's probably, you know, most people making 40, 50,000 if they're in a family or something. So, and many people above that, uh, many people. So you, you could easily say, you know, it was worth, in today's worth, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars, you know, this perfume, a lot of money. And she breaks this uh, alabaster jar of perfume and pours it all over uh, Jesus' feet. And uh, and uh, this is um, uh, probably a lot we can say. Let, let me just mention two key things here or two takeaways here. First, it says in verse three, it says, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, nard and appointed the, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I like that. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And often in the New Testament, it talks about the fragrance of Christ. And it's always associated with just unconditional, total love for Jesus and total sacrifice for him. And in some ways, that's exactly what she was doing. I mean, she was just showing her love the best she can. Every, you know, probably one of the most precious possessions she has, you know, let's break it and waste it on him. And it was a sacrifice and it produced a fragrant aroma that filled the house. And I think that's, I think this is prophetic of what God wants to do today. You know, he wants his church, he wants his house today to be filled with that fragrance of him that's characterized by what? Love and sacrifice. That when you walk in, everyone can smell it, you know. I think a second thing here is, and we, we don't see it here, but we see it in Matthew. We see it in, in uh, Mark, Mark's account. Jesus, you know, that people are kind of saying, well, you know, some of his disciples, you know, should she be doing this? And, uh, and Jesus responds and says in verse 9 of Mark 19, you know, wherever the gospel is preached in all the world, 
what this woman has done tonight will be spoken in memory of her. And again, it's that spirit of total love, total sacrifice, you know, almost to the place of I'm wasting my life on Jesus. And uh, that's the spirit that's going to take the gospel to the world. That's the spirit that's going to take the gospel and, the, and, and, and have it penetrate all the cultural, religious, satanic walls and strongholds. It's going to be the spirit of Bethany. And it's not going to be our smart ideas. It's not going to be our strategy. It's not going to be our, you know, our technology. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use any of that, but the heart of it has to be the spirit that Mary has here. And so these two events, I think, are prophetic. And they prepare also the way for what happens next. Jesus going to the cross and his resurrection. They were two defining events in the life of Jesus. These two encounters with Jesus turn out to be lessons or not just lessons, truths that are revealed to really all generations, including ours today. In fact, I think probably more pertinent for our generation than any other generation. This is what the church needs today, is the spirit of Bethany. Well, just kind of maybe finish up the story here. Judas is really offended by this. Actually, it says that he was the uh, treasurer for the group, and he used to kind of pilfer, and he's kind of thinking, wait a minute, this is a big waste, you know, uh, of so much money. And he definitely was not getting the message of what Jesus was doing, you know, there. And, and so the Pharisees, by this time, they want to get rid of Jesus. Judas goes to them and you know the story. They make an arrangement that, you know, basically later that week, uh, Judas is going to betray Jesus. Um, Jesus was too much of a threat to the Pharisees and really the whole religious system because it was touching on things of the heart. And by the way, all Jerusalem was talking now, especially after Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. Everyone knew about that. So in conclusion, both Mary and Martha have encounters with Jesus, kind of lengthy encounters, and probably on multiple occasions. But today we've looked at two significant ones that still speak to us today. May we be listening. Let's pray. Father, we ask that we would see you and know you as the resurrection and the life. Let us see the glory and the wonder of those words. And Lord, let us see it as something that really affects us. Let us see the value, the power of these words. And Lord, let us see the value and the power and the, of that complete love and that complete sacrifice that Mary showed, you know, a few days before that last Passover. May we, Lord, become a fragrant aroma in this dark, hopeless world. May we be a house that's filled with your fragrance. And may we have a heart of total love, and total sacrifice, even to the place where it looks like a waste. Lord, let that flow from us in a way that's going to touch and reach the nations. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.